I will say it was an intimidating experience teaching introductory psychology my first year with Barry, because in the very first lecture, as John Monteroso related this morning, Barry gave an extremely philosophical take on the field, including talking about causal determinism. I quickly scurried home and rewrote all of my first lecture <laughs> so that it would sound much deeper than it had originally been planned. And I actually used that material ever since. And after that lecture, Barry said, that's really good, Andrew. I like that a lot. So I, th I think it worked because at the end of that semester, uh, the students in evaluating the course, now you have to understand, they didn't, and I was an assistant professor at the time, they didn't quite understand what that meant because they wrote, and Barry knows this, Andrew was a great assistant to Barry. <laughs> Barry, Barry, by the way, loved that. As a graduate student in psychology at Penn, um, Barry was thinking about leaving psychology and was thinking about going into law. And it was Barry's experience uh, as a teaching assistant for Marty's, uh, I think, intro to psychology class, uh, where Barry found that he had a tremendous a passion, a tremendous passion for teaching. Um, and that passion is what led him to stay in the field and ultimately, I think, to come to Swarthmore. So we have Marty in part to thanks for that. Um, and uh, uh, the legal profession's loss, I think, is our tremendous gain. <laughs> Barry has stayed away from any of the abstract problems of philosophy, which are naturally raised by some of his work. Problems of truth, the nature of community, the relationship between mind and body. But by doing so, it's made the rest of of the significance of philosophy accessible to a very broad audience. In a democratic society, such accessibility in scholarly fields is perhaps the only enterprise that can prevent intellectual degradation of the electorate. Every serious philosopher should be ecstatic about the way, the way he has shown the fruitfulness of the interaction of philosophy and psychology and social theory broadly. I could not be more grateful for having had the opportunity to be his colleague and friend. What made Barry such a good intellectual, good teacher, good friend, is that he questioned, probed, refused the superficial, insisted that common truths be challenged, challenged with evidence that feelings and beliefs be defended with arguments. So we argued. I would never have imagined that three decades later we would be writing a book about how carrots and sticks and rules and incentives were destroying the practical wisdom and character that were at the root of good work and human happiness. My 30 plus years at Swarthmore are inseparable from my interactions with Barry. On arrival in 1972, Barry and Myrna were our next door neighbors. And over the course of many barbecues, Maria and I cemented a firm friendship with them that remained until today and one that's a friendship that we value very much. Barry's in my interest also overlapped. At that time, Barry was doing experimental work, uh, experimental behaviorist research, and I was engaged in a critique of behaviorism. But Barry's interest always extended to the bigger picture, to human nature, and to phenomena in the world of lived experience. And his approach to science always had a critical, reflective dimension. This led to a productive collaboration, often involving rich shoulder cry. Over a 20 year period, we wrote a book together, and I think, seven articles. The roots of my later work on the interaction of scientific activities and values were firmed in the course of our active collaboration. 